in general, path for me, soul path, what you're doing here is a first house consideration. And purpose or how you can give your gifts back. So what people will say is career, or vocation, or I like to say making a loving because I want them to align. It's a 10th house thing. And they are inherently square, which is an aspect of tension. And so there's this tension there that does not have to mean bad. It doesn't mean that like if your job isn't terrible, you're not doing this right at all. In fact, coming to resolution with that tension is a huge part of finding your way to your true vocation or making a loving. My guess is, if I were to look at a vision board that you've made, I'd see pictures of vibrant, healthy-looking people and some indication of wealth. No, I'm not talking about the cliched red Corvette or private jet, but probably something a little more custom-tailored for you. Maybe a smiling woman playing with her children in a backyard garden. Someone probably nestled in the nook of their custom-designed library with all their favorite books on the shelves. Or maybe you'd show a strong, flexible person doing yoga on a gorgeous beach. You see, we're all here having this human experience and we'd love for it to be as fulfilling as possible. But if the path was clear and living it was easy, we'd all be doing it. Here's the good news. There are keys in your astrology chart to discovering your vision of health, wealth, and fulfillment. And beginning in September, we have three master astrologers who are gonna show you how to find it. You can learn more and enroll now at the promotional pricing in the link in the show notes or at astrologyhub.com slash workshop. So here's to living your vision of health, wealth, and fulfillment. I really hope to see you there. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Astrology Hub podcast. If you're new here, please leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to the channel. We pretty much post a new video every day. And if you like astrology, you're curious about anything mystical, we probably have a video for you. Uh, today, I have uh, Gemini Brett with me, one of my favorite astrologers, one of my favorite people in the whole entire world. Uh, and we'll be talking about... Uh, <laughs> and we'll be talking about purpose and career. Like, are those two things the same? Sometimes I get people in readings and things like that coming in. And they ask about their purpose, but then they're really asking about career. And some other times they're asking about career, but they're really asking about purpose. And so it's hard to discern the difference between these two things. So I'm hoping that Brett can help me answer this question today. Is purpose and career the same thing? Are they different? How, how does that work? I believe they are different, but we would like for them to agree. Um, first of all, you know, purpose, I think, can be a very subjective term. And I often use it to work more with that kind of vocational thing, or I like to say, you know, where we can make a loving rather than mm. just a living. Um, but that's when our purpose and our path are in agreement. So I think I'm using the term path in the way that you're using the term purpose. And for me, career, it's like just such a loaded word because it feels so culturally ordained about you've been on this track and you chose this thing and you went perhaps and did this study and got this degree and maybe you did more of that and now you have to do this thing that all of that points to um so i for some reason personally like work more easily with the vocation term and then again i just like to say how to make a loving but in a sense that for me is like you know, service orientation, like how do you give the fruits from your world tree back to community, right? Like how do you plug in? How do you offer your gifts in that way? Where for me, path or, you know, I guess we could say soul purpose is a much more uniquely individual thing. And I mean, it can be that your path here is completely oriented towards what you do for you know, work to use that term that I don't love and so much as well. It can be not at all. So when I say like making a loving and vocation, I mean, ideally we would all be receiving abundance for doing something that we really love, right? 
go all the way back to wise souls who have told us that if you have a job that's about something you love, you'll never work a day in your life, right? Um, but for some people, I feel like their path is all about learning or all about exploring and sometimes having like a jobby job that pays the bills and takes care of that stuff, right? And then you get to do your thing and your time off. Like, I can see that working. So I'm not here to judge or point fingers, but I'm always looking for this in a chart, right? And when I do look for what I feel is more like kind of soul purpose or I call that path aligned, I start my investigation into that exploration in a different place of the astrology chart than I would the question of, you know, what's a good job for me or how can I make a loving in this place called Earth? Right. And is that like, and this whole question about soul purpose, is that a question that an astrologer can even answer? Because we always fall into this realm of free will versus fatedness and how fate it is your sole purpose or is that something that you can actually do you have a choice of what your sole purpose is where do you lie on that in between i mean some astrologies i think definitely claim that they can see it instantly in the chart and if you're not doing this thing then you're completely off path or something first of all i'll say the most beautiful thing about the path is you can't leave it yeah, right. Even when you feel most lost in the woods, that was so you could go get a tour of the strange beings who live there and come quote unquote back. But it's not a detour, it's your tour, you know. But, you know, I, I feel that astrology can very much help us get to know ourselves, understand more about why we have incarnated and come here to Earth, um, and also show us some talents and challenges. And, uh, and yeah, show things like, you know, what type of mate would be great for you? Or is that kind of monogamous mate thing even your scene, right? And first of all, the person is going to know better than me. And so I really try to keep that. Well, let me tell you who you are because I see the code of your soul here on my computer screen thing in check, right? As you know, as a working astrologer too, Joe, like it's really exciting when you see the astrology just playing out literally. Like father's job, right, is like in a person's chart, right? And when you see that and hear it's true, it's like mind blowing and world shattering and all the things. But I try my best to let the client in a session oh, I guess be the, the stronger force. And I'm here to just like reflect what I hear in their song is the way that I prefer to say that rather than reading a chart, like I can see everything that was written about them. But yeah, I also, however, like I said, I'm in between. I definitely believe that the chart has clues for us, keys for us to unlock doors to a way of life that's potentially more in alignment with the soul code. And what would be some of those like signifiers in the chart? Like how would you separate them when looking at a chart? And what are some of the, the main points that you'd look at for helping somebody decipher it? Yeah, well, so let's start super basic first and then get a little deeper into it. Um, first of all, the answer to any question astrologically is found in the entire chart. But where we begin the investigation will depend upon the question, right? If somebody's asking about their kids, we say that children are represented by fifth house and fifth house, let me just say fifth house things, right? And so my investigation will begin there. But if I'm doing it right, it wants to be holistic and eventually it's going to bring me to the entire chart. But an amazing thing is like the chart in a sense is a different being if you look through the eyes of the fifth house of children versus the seventh house of partner and relationship. Yeah. And so, I mean, even when we say like a vocation or how to make a loving, like I'm going to do the whole chart. And that includes all of your astrology. But in general, when somebody asks about soul path, for me, my eyes go straight to the ascendant. And this will be a place where, you know, the way that I astrologize, at least in this current time of my go in my study and my sharing is going to be very different than what it is for many. I mean, maybe even most because these days we know this kind of you're going towards your north node 
approach to astrology had become very popular by the likes of evolutionary astrology paradigms that really have kind of branched out of Dane Rajar, possibly. Um, for me, I was initially informed by Daniel Jamario at the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School, now the Turning of the Ages Mystery School. And so I learned that it's about the Ascendant and that that has a lot to do with where you're heading, what you're learning. Um, so a poem that found its way through me in that investigation was what was rising when you rose is rising within you. And I'll get back to why I feel you can also raise it up. Okay, so to get a little less poetic so people can hear the words I'm attempting to say, I look for the rising sign first and foremost about path or soul purpose or you know whatever you want to call it. Like Literally, why have I incarnated? Okay, so let's be there for a second. Why would we come to such a place as this? And I would suggest that the answer is form. In a place with the appearance of time and space, you are able to grow. And you can only grow in a place with the appearance of time and space. And so for me, the whole role or purpose of an incarnation is, as I like to say, spirit reflecting itself through a unique soul into matter, a place with the appearance of time and space, so spirit itself can grow. Spirit is everything. And therefore, it's essentially nothing. It can't grow. It can't make moves. But this miracle happened called you and you and you and you and you, which is spirit reflected in a unique way, which will never repeat for me that soul into matter, into this place with the appearance of time and space. So you can make moves so you can grow because as you grow, the one and only thing grows. And for me, that's a general statement of soul, purpose, path, why we are here. And I find kind of the design of your growth game encoded in the rising sign and many associated things that we'll get back to. Okay. So for me, the growth path, the, the sole purpose begins by looking through the eyes of the first house. Now, as I said, I first learned that in the shamanic astrology mystery school. So when I got to like my first astrology conference, I was kind of surprised to find that most people were going at this thing in a very different way. And I had done it enough and worked with clients enough by that point that um, I knew it worked. And I try to remain open-hearted, open-minded enough not to say it's the right way and everything else is wrong at all. Why would everybody else go about it in a different way and also have success, right? So it's like, hmm, interesting, this whole other thing's happening. I should look at that too. But one of the things that happened for me is also getting back into traditional astrology. And then when I learned things like the first sign, the rising sign, and maybe even the ascendant degree, right? Like literally the degree of the zodiac that was rising on the eastern horizon in the moment of your becoming. When I learned that traditionally, it's that point that was called the horoscope. That horoscope is in some newspaper column or, or some um, just map of a sky, which actually is an appropriate term for that word but that it derives from horoscopos, Greek for our marker, or some say our watcher, like, you know, sitting on the pyramid back in the day, looking for stars to rise and calling them out, you know, um, that that is the ascended degree. So it was like, huh, the ancient the Hellenistic language has something that seems to agree with this idea that it's all about the rising sign. And I think maybe even more importantly, another term in the ancient Greek for the ascendant, um, true to this kind of maritime metaphor, which we find in Hellenistic astrology all over the place, is that the ascendant was called oiox or iakos, which means rudder, right? <laughs> and so many call it the helm. But when I hear like helm of a boat, the image is of that kind of like big wooden steering wheel thing. And they didn't have that back in the day. It was the rudder and the tiller. And there's a very important astronomical source to that, which is that the ascended descended axis is not due east and due west on the horizons. Astrologies teach, I find, but rather it rudders back and forth across the cardinal directions every day, heading to the northern extreme, which is zero Cancer rising, to the southern extreme, zero Capricorn rising. 
And that idea of the ruddering of the ascendant speaks to, for me, your personal directions. All right. So the first thing for me is like, okay, what's the rudder? Like I was born with a Gemini rudder. And uh, is it okay for me to share Joe's ascended? Um, Joe was born with cancer rising. So cancer rudder. And um, therefore, Joe is said to be a child of the moon by some astrologies, where me with Gemini rising, a child of Mercury. So I typically begin with the rising sign. Um, and what has changed for me is I went back into traditional astrology because the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School, they don't do the domicile thing or to use a more modern term like rulerships. They find it with the rising sign and they work with the lunar nodes in a different way than most do. But for me, as I've gone back to traditional astrology, I've really seen kind of the beauty of this planet sign relationship, which Hermes gave us in the theme of Mundi, the chart of the world so, so long ago. And that I can see with Gemini rising that Mercury is going to, in a sense, be the guide for my path. So one of the ways that for me with Gemini rising, Mercury would be described or somebody out there with, oh, Sagittarius rising Jupiter or somebody with Taurus rising Venus is that planet is the one that has their hand on the rudder. They're your steersmen, to use this ancient term. And there's many, many, many ways in traditional astrology to look at different planets that are like principal guides for you. Um, but that's one of the essential ways to use the modern terminology, which I don't love because the ruler world just feels a little too patriarchal to me. But regardless, like the ruler of the rising sign is another for me significant key the rising sign what was rising when you rose is rising within you it's what you're here to learn it's the school of your growth and then the steersman planet that's said to rule that sign in all of his or her relations in the chart their relations in the chart where they are what house they're in their aspects of other planets again it's going to lead to the entire chart but a huge piece for me like i'm gemini rising with mercury and libra in the fifth next to Pluto and an opposite Jupiter. And I could go on and on and on. Like again, the whole chart is going to come through. But my investigation personally begins with the rising sign when I'm looking for path. Why did I incarnate? And the answer is to grow. Okay, but how and in which way? And to get back to this idea of what was rising when you rose is rising within you and you can raise it up. Like Libra has the right to evolve too. And if you were born with Libra rising, I will say that you're here to learn Libra and you're here to help Libra learn because as you grow, spirit grows and your ascended sign is ascending in you and you can help lift it up. Like truthfully, the Eastern horizon, the sky on the Eastern horizon, according to modern astronomy, it's only rising because earth is falling in that direction. And so the idea there is we descend into matter to the heavens, right? So for you, Joe, cancer rising, how can you learn cancer? And can you, how can you help cancer learn? For me, Gemini rising, how can I learn Gemini? How can I help Gemini itself grow? And there's something in my own chart very significantly with Mercury in the sign of Libra and in the fifth or in your chart with because cancer rising, where's the moon? Well, the moon's in Leo. In the second sign, what does that have to say? Right. All right. I, I really like something that you said earlier about soul purpose or the path is that. Oh yes, it's like the the purpose that that you come into life is is to to grow. Um, I, I think just kind of like um, narrowing down that way, and even thinking about people conflating those two and uh, thinking about purpose as careers. Like, is your purpose really to come here just to work? <laughs> yeah. Like that would be like such a well, not to some people, it's probably great, but <laughs> uh, for maybe for me, a cancer rising, that's not uh, so much a, a great thing to think about. Um, if you went to school, you were likely taught that is your truth and we're learning how to be workers, right? So, yeah. I mean, working a job and being in service to community can be the same thing. It depends if you've kind of found your calling, I'll say. Um, but again, mm. Sometimes you're calling. I mean, I, I think overall your soul calling, your path is to grow. And perhaps your greatest opportunities for growth 
are really just found in not giving so much of your energy to some notion, right? Because you're here to become the greatest philosopher of all time, and you just need to sit on the mountaintop. But because we need to eat too, you probably have a job, but that job allows you to fly to that mountain (laughs) and and spend some time, whatever it may be. It'd be really nice, right? If there was no need to like spend our time working at all. But then again, I don't think it would be. And I think you would find, and we often do, that people have the means to like not quote unquote have to work some job. Will anyway, because there's really something about being here in community, being a earthling, right? Um, so there's a lot more to say about path and where I look for that. I'll just say a couple things. Like it's not just for me about the rising sign and where the steersmen of that rudder lives. It's other planets that are in the first house. It's their associations. It's the connection of the steersmen of the chart, kind of looking through the eyes of the first house at that world, then looking through the eyes of the steersmen wherever that planet resides, and just looking for all those connections. And once again, any question I ask, if I'm doing it right, and I try to, um, is going to bring me to the whole chart, right? But again, if I look through the eyes of the first, it's a very different story than if I look through the eyes of the 10th. And that tends to be where I want to gaze through if I'm going to begin my investigations with the wheel by asking questions like, what's a good job for me? <laughs> or I like to say more poetically, right? How can I give the fruits from my own world tree back to this earth, right? Um, how can I be of service and the like? And the tenth house is not the only place for that at all, but it's typically where I begin my investigation. And by the way, anytime we say the tenth house, you say what house system? <laughs> the great conundrum. And true to my moniker, Gemini, I like to use several. One of the things that people ask very often is how to synthesize all of this, like. Yes, we know that the Ascendant is a a starting place that we can look at, and then the Ruler of the Ascendant is another place that we can look at. But how do you actually extract meaning out of those placements? Like, yes, you know, let's say a a random person has a Taurus rising, and they have Venus in Leo, and they're looking at their chart. I have Venus in Leo. This planet is somehow showing me my path or my purpose. How do you make sense of that? Yeah, well, so we can't necessarily be that computer that believes every Taurus rising chart with Venus and Leo is the same, right? And so this is an art that we're playing with here. And so some of that just comes through tons of study and more importantly, experience in life, which you all have, right? Sitting with the charts of people you love and maybe some that you don't love so much. Right. I'm really blessed as you are, Joe, to have an opportunity to sit with so many like grow, growing souls who are authentic and willing to reflect back to me um, and answer questions. And sometimes I'm there and sometimes I completely miss. And so we learn that way. But generally speaking, Taurus rising, Venus and Leo play that game. Right. So Taurus rising for me, what's rising in you is returning to the earth, learning more simplicity. There are many givers in the Zodiac, but Taurus is one that reminds us of the importance of receiving, like receiving this moment now, slowing down. Taurus, bull, they say, but I prefer cow who has seven stomachs. It's a slow digestion, right? Like being in this moment, escaping the tendencies of your rat race training to rest in the grace of earth's pace beauty for taurus is a spiritual practice so me for me first and foremost these are all learning tools i think especially in our culture and in kind of spiritual oriented um folks like ourselves it's really hard to actually receive and not try to instantly overgive. <laughs> and taurus i think really wants us to remember this Yeah, so typically if I see Taurus rising, fixed sign, and I like to say fix yourself to fix the world, 
there's something about learning beauty, embodiment, coming down to earth, finding your own beauty, regardless of what the scary skeletons of the silver screen comparison paradigm <laughs> poison would tell you who you are and who you are not. Now with Venus and Leo, because Venus is the steersman or steerswoman or whatever we want to say, steers planet of a Taurus rising chart, there's something about learning this kind of archetypal essence of royalty, radiance, this creation through Leo, where we remember that we have been made in the form of creator because we are creators and you are here to shine the light and offer that radiant heat by which we can ignite our own candle. Now, with Taurus rising, Leo is the fourth. So there's something about Venus also being that fourth house of home and family. Like I would expect that to be a, a venue of really significant soul awakening. And by the way, we, we typically awaken from nightmares, not from dreams, which isn't to say in any regard that's meant to be some nightmare path. But typically the, mysticism, the mystic has had a difficult time with at least one of the parents or something to kind of get the show on, right? I would say there, Taurus rising, Venus and Leo, really learning to embody your own radiance, your creativity, um, and sharing that kind of as a, as a leader reminder of creative play is the way of life that's going to lead you on a path of simplicity. You know? Is Venus a morning star? Maybe reflecting Virgo sunlight? Is Venus under the beams of Leo sun? Is Venus an evening star? reflecting oh gemini light to my eyes or is it cancer light where is the moon and mars <laughs> and all of the other beings and so just having a blanket statement for taurus rising venus and leo does not work for me and i'm willing to offer at least that much but i really need to then get into the chart to understand so much more about venus because venus and leo that tells me one very important and beautiful thing but if it's in v if it's Venus and Leo conjunct Pluto versus Venus and Leo trine Neptune, right? Like there's different stories through the different beautiful geometries and other notes in the song and how they relate to one another and stimulate one another. And so I, I can never stop there. Sweet. And and so would you recommend people? Like, let's say a, a person watching this right now wants to learn about the, the ruler of the ascendant, which recommend that they like write down a list of all the aspects that that planet has, the sign and the mood and all of these things to start to put these pieces together. Absolutely. Yeah. And really, depending on your kind of approach to astrology as well, like if you're very tuned into the lunar nodes, for example, what is a Taurus rising chart with Venus and Leo when the nodes are in Aries? Libra versus, oh, Gemini, Sagittarius, etc. But yeah, my approach is, what's the rising sign? Where's the steers planet, right? So if it's a Libra rising, where's Venus? Are there other planets in the first house? Because they're going to be so personal, like they might even take over from the steers person. It's like, you know, she's reaching far across space to try to get to the rudder and somebody's just right there. It's like, I'll handle that. Um, there are many conditions in traditional astrology, especially where if the ruler of the ascendant is in place or a house in the chart that can't see the ascendant, you might find an alternate. And we're not going to get into all of that right now. But I'll say the ascendant itself, planets in the first, in all their relations, the ruler of the first, the steersman, in all their relations, like that's kind of place I begin. And it's hard for me to understand where somebody's going which i believe is in the rising sign what's rising when you rose is rising within you if i don't know where they came from and so i have like a very different cosmology there like i had first learned from daniel jamario at the shamanic astrology mystery school that that's in the moon and they work with a combination of moon and south in that paradigm i've come to work with moon and sun moon taught me this once I mean, it's really through my sacred geometry study, but even just like kind of having one of the silly little simple discoveries one night out laying in the grass and drinking juice and moon said, uh, you're looking at sunlight, you know, 
because when we look at them, we're actually seeing sunlight reflected to our eyes. This is true when you gaze at Jupiter too. Jupiter is reflecting sunlight through Jupiter's unique mirror, right? It's a little more, I don't know, interesting with the moon perhaps because we watch her change phases every month and that, you know. But I will say this and very importantly, astronomically, the moon will never reflect the sunlight twice in the same way. Or we will never reflect sunlight the same way twice. And for me, this speaks of soul and spirit. Again, subjective terms, but when I say spirit, I mean the one and only thing that ever was, is, and will be the all. And I feel in our local experience, the sun is our representative and of that of the one of spirit. The sun, you know, you'll never know what stars the sun is aligned to by looking. You'll go blind trying. Um, and there's this old cosmology. I'm not saying it's true in 3D reality or whatever, but that stars are actually just holes in the firmament. Okay, so that there's this veil that shields us from the one only light, because if we saw it, we would remember we are it, and then the gig is up, right? But that there's these little holes in the veil so we can get reminders of what we truly are, and that's what stars are, and they're each unique and each have a being. And then the sun is the one that we're close to, right? And it's, so it's like our local kind of gigantic hole of, through the veil, the one reminder of what we really are, which is spirit. But if we were only spirit, we would have never grow. It's the one only thing. And in that sense, it's nothing. And so spirit, when reflecting upon itself, performed this strange miracle that no one could possibly explain, which is to not divide itself, that's impossible, but reflect itself and reflect itself in a unique way, which will never repeat. That's a soul. And I see that in all the, the whole chart. But I start with how is the moon reflecting sunlight to my eyes? And so I want to be there also as much as I'm looking at what I see is like what's rising in you. We could say kind of the forward direction of the path. If I don't understand about what you're, where you're coming from, and what you're bringing in to this world with you, I won't understand about your habits, tendencies, strengths, et cetera. Um, that gives me so much more of a picture. Yeah. So one thing I encourage for folks, if that kind of cosmology interests you, is spend time every month and throughout the year and the years contemplating how does this moon reflect sunlight to my eyes? So I was born with the moon in Gemini, but the sun is in Scorpio. So how does Gemini, I like to say, deliver Scorpio light to Earth? Or right now, for example, the moon is in Virgo, reflecting Leo sunlight to my eyes. And then, well, what does it mean for that Virgo moon to be between Mercury and Mars and dot, 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 the whole chart, <laughs> right? Nice. Um, and are we able to translate some of these techniques also when we're looking at like career or vocation in our chart? Or do we have to kind of reframe and look at it in a different way. No, I mean, that's the whole genius of um, dispositorship, right? And the idea that these signs are like, well, I prefer the old term domicile lord and lady. I don't love those terms anyway, but you and I know it as like a landlord, right? You know, or who owns the Airbnb that you're staying in? You know what I'm saying? Like that really matters, right? Um, and so... I, it's a very similar thing, and that's why I've really embraced um, this kind of ancient play that most astrology paradigms use uh, these days. They call rulerships, right? Because it, um, we're looking at um, a vocational sign, like let's say the 10th sign of your chart is Leo. Then where's the sun? Because Leo is the sun sign, right? If, if it's Virgo, where's Mercury? If it's Libra, where's Venus, right? And so in that sense, it's a very similar rule you can play. And so I'll use the old terminology, like what is the sign on the 10th, right? If it's Scorpio, does that mean you're meant to be a ninja or a detective? Or you know, like, I think we can take this archetypal astrology too far and it doesn't take us far enough. Like there's more than 12 jobs in the world, right? Um, but you at least get 144, because if it's Scorpio, where's Mars? Now, some would look for Pluto, right? But I'm more key to the old approach, and that's Mars's own. 
but Scorpio with Mars in Scorpio versus Scorpio with Mars in Sagittarius or Capricorn. Like that's already going to get me a good amount of information. But I want to see, just like with the rising sign and the steers men of the chart, well, are there planets in the first? What kind of relationships does the steersman have? Same thing with the 10th sign. Are there planets in the 10th? What are their relations? What's their story in that sign? You know, the 10th is, oh, Cancer, where's the moon? What are the moon's relations, right? And so again, it's going to eventually bring me to the whole chart. Um, but that's where I'll begin my investigation. However, what is the 10th house? And this brings us into house systems again, okay? And I work with, very importantly, I work with two distinct points in your chart to look for career signatures. Um, and one of them is the midheaven degree. And I don't stop there because the midheaven degree, contrary to popular teachings, is not right above your head. It's also typically not even the highest part of the zodiac when you were born. Right now, that should sound surprising to most of you because that is the incorrect astronomy that most astrologers teach around the midheaven. The highest part of the chart is always square to the ascendant. Right. So if your rising sign is 22 Libra, then 22 degrees Cancer is the highest part of the zodiac, the highest part above the ground, reaching for the heavens. Even if your midheaven is at five Cancer or 29 Cancer or even another sign. So for example, I have Gemini rising. My midheaven is in Aquarius. But the square to my ascendant and therefore the highest part of the zodiac above the ground, and we could say, therefore, in a sense, the most visible part is square to Gemini, and that's in Pisces. So I'm looking both at the midheaven degree and this degree that some call the non agesimal which just means 90 degrees away. Some call it the zenith because though it is not directly above your head at the top of the sky. It is the part of the zodiac that's closest to the top of the sky. Um, and I'm going to look at those, both of those points, even if they're in the same sign, because one thing I want to look at is aspects from planets to those points. You might have a planet that's trying the top of your chart and your software or wherever you're looking probably is not drawing a little line to that point. Um, the midheaven degree, let me just say a thing about the astronomy of, you know, what is the midheaven if it's the highest part? It is what in the moment is culminating or reaching its particular highest height. So the midheaven is on the meridian, which is a circle that runs through the cardinal directions north and south, and therefore separates the eastern sky, which ups, from the western sky, which downs. <laughs> so it's a very important point. And it is in the moment of your birth. So I was born with 14 Aquarius culminating at the midheaven. Like that's the highest altitude that that particular degree of the zodiac would reach that day. However, Pisces was higher. Pisces will later after the, my birth moment reach a higher height. So I'm going to work for me personally with both Pisces and therefore where's Jupiter and Aquarius and therefore where's Saturn. And then in kind of Gemini fashion, I get all these variables in the equation gets a little thicker, but I, that for me, that's fun. And typically that's the truth. People will have worked like several different versions of career themes. And I often sit with people who are kind of like looking for one thing that re resonates with who they are, agrees with their talents and tendencies and offers challenge and those kinds of things. And it's like combining all this experience you've had on earth, right? So like, what'd you learn when you did paper route or a lemonade stand? <laughs> what did you, what'd you learn first job out of school or whatever? And we want to combine all those things. And I want to combine all these chart factors too. And how do you differ differentiate what each of those points tell you? Do you kind of just blend all of those rulers together and come up with like a delineation that blends both of their significations? Or do you say the non adjustable tells you a certain aspect of what vocation might look like and then the actual midheaven tells you something a little bit different? 
Right. You're asking great questions, which allows me to kind of get into the astronomy of the thing. Because I'm very much a sky guy or an earth astrologer, as I like to say. So my astrology itself is consistently reinformed by my experience of the sky and trying to find the chart in the sky and bringing more of the sky into the chart. It does then lead me towards kind of technical answers. <laughs> so my apologies if this just sounds like a full astro nerd over here. But I want to ask what those points are actually doing. Right? And one of them, the midheaven degree, is not only culminating or reaching its highest height. And this, by the way, is why traditional astrology is associated with like middle life. The rising sign is new, right? That's youth. And I think that even there has so much to do with path. Like before, like our tendencies to go find a career took us away from what we want to be. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Um, and I want to speak more about that square. Just, just say so in case you felt that. So let me go back to the idea of the first and the tenth being inherently square, and therefore the design has tension built between path and purpose, if we use those terms, or your soul purpose and career or whatever. Okay. Anyway, the culminating point is on the meridian. It's on this north-south great circle. Like where I was born in Boston, it's always due south. Where you were born, Joe, in Brazil. It is always due north. Okay. Either way, it's a cardinal direction. It's one of Earth's directions. In fact, because, I mean, contrary to popular teachings in astrology, the ascendant and descendant axis are rarely perfectly east west. They only are twice a day when zero Aries and zero tropical Libra rise, the equinox points. Okay. Otherwise, your ascendant is north of east or south of east. If your ascendant is north of east, your descendant is south of west. If your ascendant is south of east, your descendant is north of west. And it rudders back and forth every day. Okay, so in other words, you have your own personal directions. But where we can find Earth's directions on the chart are the meridian. The MC degree, for me, due south. The IC beneath our feet, due north. Okay, so... I'm, I need to get technically to or technical here to kind of, I guess, support why I'll say this. The Midheaven's going to speak about how you connect into your planet, right? And that's going to, in a sense, be more related to the actual job you do, I guess. That's typically a pretty earthly consideration. But how you feel or do work or you know, more of like your energetic calling, I'm going to find that more in that non agesimal point, that point that's highest above the ground, a point that squares the ascendant um, because it's aligned to your personal directions. Okay, so if my shoulders are east-west and I raise my hands up, then I'm pointing to the MC, the meridian. That's like Earth's directions. If my shoulders are on my own personal rudder, so in my case, I have Gemini rising, it's north of east, Sagittarius setting south of west, and I bring my hands Pisces. That's more aligned to my personal directions. And so I take that information of like, what personally excites you feels good to you. And then I bring that to, well, how do you plug into Earth and her directions? Like, how do you serve and connect and offer your gifts back. And I want to combine those things, even if they're only like, I'm looking at a chart for where I'm sitting right now. They're four degrees apart. <laughs> okay. So they're in the same size. I'm sitting right now at Libra rising. The non decimal is like 23 cancer and the mid heavens 27 cancer. I mean, it's like, they're so close. All right. They're actually 23 and 26, but still the way that different planets connect to or relate to or have aspects with or see those two different points tell me a bit of a different story. And for many of us, our midheaven degree is very far from the highest degree of the chart. And like for me and many of us, oftentimes in totally different signs, right? And so, I mean, that might be too much information. <laughs> and I appreciate this opportunity to get a little bit technical here. Um, but yeah, those are all things that I'm working with. And then again, like if I have Pisces on the 10th, and by the way, the highest point of your chart, because it squares the ascendant, will always be in your 10th whole sign. 
even when you're midheaven. And I should add that piece. Like I have my midheaven in Aquarius midheaven and in a Gemini rising chart. Well, Aquarius is the ninth sign of Gemini. And so because the midheaven is in the ninth whole sign, that offers a story too. I should be a travel agent or maybe an astrologer. Traditionally, it's the ninth that is the house of astrology, for example. Okay. But what about the 10th sign? What about Pisces? And where is Jupiter in that? I want to like combine all these things. I mean, that's the art of astrology. Like this is thing that's going to be difficult for computers to do. Even like the great AI or whatever. And maybe I'm sure they're going to get there. I just spit on myself when I said that though, because it terrifies me in some ways. Mm. But you know, there's, there's, there's much art to what we do. And it's like kind of the combination of these, I guess, variables um, into a meaningful story, you know, that is really the art of astrology. And, you know, different astrologers using different techniques, different paradigms, but also just being different people are going to combine these things, even if they're looking at the same exact things in different ways. And so you're going to find an astrologer that speaks to you or an astrology that speaks to you, right? And I hope that everyone will also reserve the right to change. Like my personal cosmology and the way I approach the chart has changed four times now. All right. So even if you don't have time to ask this question, I want to answer it, Joe. Um, in general, path for me, soul path, what you're doing here is a first house consideration and purpose or how you can give your gifts back. So what people will say is career, vocation, or I like to say making a loving because I want them to align. It's a 10th house thing. And they are inherently square, which is an aspect of tension. And so there's this tension there that does not have to mean bad. It doesn't mean that like, if your job isn't terrible, you're not doing this right at all. In fact, coming to resolution with that tension is a huge part of finding your way to your true vocation or making a loving. There isn't a thing that can happen in your life that isn't part of your path. Um, and that is your purpose, um, including the whack job that you're about to quit because you want to be this <laughs> or that. <right? laughs> so, by the way, the 10th career is a general significator for it or signification of it, as is, oh, I like to say your legend, okay, but honors, reputation, these things. It is square the seventh of relationship. Have you out there in the astrology world ever had issues in a marriage because of your job or had issues with your job because of your marriage <laughs> or it doesn't have to be a marriage? Like, have you felt tensions? In relation, like right now, I'm in the midst of creating. I'm working with Astrology Hub as an inner circle guide right now, and I'm making stuff. And I get nuts about that. If you remember what I said before, I'm Gemini rising with Mercury and Libra. Well, that's the fifth. For me, it's like I create, therefore I am. And when I have an opportunity to do that in a mercurial way, and astrology really fits the bill, then it's just like nonstop. And I'm making stuff. But that, tends to take me away from, oh, I'm also like a family guy. <laughs> I'm also a partner. And um, I also, oh, I have an email account. What? Right? You know, and so I think an important thing to know too is while the chart will guide us, perhaps even to like specific job titles. I just had a session this morning and, and the person I was speaking to was really resistant to the idea of naming a career that would be a good fit for their energetic. And they said, uh, you know, I just don't want to like fall prey to this paradigm of, you know, like you have to go get a degree and go do that. And, and I said, I hear you. But at the same time, you probably want to be able to put something on your business card if you want to be working. And that's up to you. And, and, and they wanted to be an astrologer. They want to be an astrologer. We'll be an astrologer. And I'm like, well, if you know what you want to be, just name it. But then, of course, we get into all of our complexes. 
but I'm not a master of that. I don't think I ever could be. I can't do that like the Rick Levine, or, you know, whatever, <laughs> right? Um, and yes, you can, but just remind us once again that the answer to any question is the whole chart. Because if you have some, you know, uh, what is it called? Uh, in, imposter syndrome, I think, right? Um, just in your kind of natural design, or if that was part of your training and that's something you're like, you know, moving through and growing through and shifting, like that's going to apply likely to any question we might ask of the chart, right? So my game, I guess I should say, or my job is as people are asking questions, I'm trying to ask the most essential question of myself who is this person and why are they here? And actually the real question is why did spirit reflect itself in this unique way to come here and play? And I know it's to grow, but how and why, what did they bring in the like? So I'll share finally a thing that I heard from one of my favorite teachers who I sadly, at least in body will never meet who is Alan Watts. And Alan Watts talks about how you're sitting with guru and I'm not in any way trying to say that I'm guru, okay? But you're sitting with guru and things are silent and you're not at all because your mind is like, oh my God, they see how I'm just a disaster and how this is what turns me on and how I was mean to that kid two years ago or in third grade or whatever. And he's like, no, no what the guru is doing is they're like, oh, I see Brahma. Like, I see how you decided to bring yourself in this particular image, right? Like they're seeing the light in you, the universe in you, the guide guide us in you. And, you know, I think that for me, first and foremost, is um, how I wish to approach any opportunity to sit with these amazing souls that I, I'm able to connect with every day. Just really, uh, it's my, like my job is cool because I meet so many amazing beings who consistently kind of reinstate and reinvigorate my faith that even when I look at a TV screen and things are just awful out there, <laughs> there are so many amazing, wonderful, growing beings, right? And I want to honor that like first and foremost, even if they're asking me, you know, when's a good day to launch their website? Oh my God, that was awesome. And uh, for you guys who do want to get a reading with Brett, um, the link is astrologyhub.com forward slash Brett Connect, I think, or Gemini Connect, one of the two, or probably both. But <laughs> thank you so much for sharing everything that you have today. Um, I think that this gives uh, people a very solid starting place uh, for looking at their charts, um, um, especially if they're trying to separate like career from purpose or from like their path or anything like that. Um, for anyone who does want to go a little bit deeper into this whole um, exploration of what career might look like for you or what purpose might look like for you and you're really into looking at your own charts or even or maybe you even want to become an astrologer who reads off people's charts astrology hub does have a workshop coming up very soon actually a series of workshops with our fall workshop series the health wealth and fulfillment series and it's being taught by three amazing astrologers um michael bryan is focusing on the purpose side of things and M michael bryan bryan is a traditional astrologer as well so if you resonated with some of the things that brett shared today i know that michael will touch about the ascendant and, and things like that in a and at least a somewhat similar way as well and georgia stathis will be teaching about um like financial astrology and how to actually look at uh, your finances in your chart uh, and some techniques to to really um, maximize on how much you can um, earn and feel fulfilled in life. And Judith Hill will also be teaching um, medical astrology and she'll be focusing on the signs. So she'll be telling you all of the body parts associated with them, uh, the symptoms associated with each of the signs. So if you're into medical astrology, um, this one is definitely for you as well. And of course, you can get all three workshops in a bundle. And I think we'll be running for three weeks. And when you do get all three workshops, you do get one of them for free. So um, it's, it's essentially getting three workshops for the price too. And the link to 
find out more about that is astrologyhub.com forward slash workshop. And if you do want to learn more with Brett, we also do have tons and tons of courses with Brett. We talked about annual perfections in the past. We talked about astral locality. What else have you done, Brett? I know that you well, did. The big one is the sacred astronomy course. So some of that oh, information yeah. today about like how the earth and the earth sky relationship is teaching me how to go about this thing. And if you want to bring more of the sky into the chart and see the chart in the sky, then the sacred astronomy course is a really wonderful place to play. If you do want to see all of these courses, um, all you got to do is go to astrologyhub.com forward slash academy. You see Brett's courses there and a whole lot of other library of many, many courses. All right, guys, we'll see you on the next episode. And thanks for spending some time with us today.